for this microphone was on my back, and the back of the pew popped it right off, so it was, it was hanging down like a tail off my back. And then this thing came off, and I'm going, Karen, snap this thing back on, hurry. So I was, uh, I was going to talk about the Rockies game last night, but uh, in the awkward moments while I'm putting all my notes here, but there are some things that prayer just can't fix. So I'm not going to say anything about the Rockies. Anyway, uh, turn, if you would, in your Bibles to Acts chapter 2. I'm just kidding. I just thought you might be so conditioned after the last few weeks that you might want to turn there anyway. Then you can go back to Luke. That's cool. Um, you know, a few years ago at this church, we taught uh, Awanas. And uh, at the end of the first lesson, up in the corner of, of the page on page 52, there was a question that said, am I a disciple? And I thought about that. It was a good question. Well, what is a disciple? You know, we, we, we're, we're supposed to uh, teach people to be disciples. That's what we're supposed to do as a church. That's what Jesus told us in Matthew 28, verse 19. He says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. The Greek word for the word teach there means to teach, instruct, or make a disciple. That's why a lot of your versions say, say make a disciple. Uh, Paul also used the same Greek word in Acts chapter 14, verse 21, in his first missionary journey with, with Barnabas. It says, and when they had preached the gospel to that city, they were in Derby, and had taught many, they returned again to Lystra and to Iconium and Antioch. That phrase, had taught, is the same Greek word in Matthew 28, 19. They went to Derby and made disciples. They were teaching them. But in verse number 20 of Acts 28, it says, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Well, that's a different Greek word totally. It means a continuing teaching to instill doctrine. This, we don't just make a disciple and then leave him out to dry. Um, and rest assured, to, to, to be a disciple, you must start by accepting Christ as your Savior. That's where it begins. We are definitely a spiritual army, but it's an all-volunteer force, folks. We have no draft. So we start with, with the recruitment. We start with the disciple. We make them. We, 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 teach, we give them the gospel, and then we continue to teach them. Why do we do that? Well, Paul told us why in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints or equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. That's what we do. Folks, you can't know, you can't know a counterfeit gospel unless you know what the gospel says. You have to be on guard. You have to know what it is. And that's what we do. We teach the Word of God. And the, and the noun disciples found 29 times in the New Testament. It means learner or pupil. But they did much more. These, these disciples did much more than just learn a subject or, or study a subject. They would follow their teacher or rabbi around. They, they walk with him. It was, there was a personal attachment you know, as I thought about that question, am I a disciple? You could probably ask any child of God, any Christian, say, are you a disciple? Yeah, you bet you I am. Of course I am. Are we? You know, I, I, I think we may have a watered down and pretty wimpy view of the word disciple, what it means to be a disciple. It's not nearly as easy as following Jesus' Twitter account or liking Jesus' Facebook page. I threw that in for the younger people. I have no idea about either one of those. My wife likes Facebook. She shows me all the kids, grandkids' pictures, but I know nothing about it. But it's a lot more than that. We may think it is, but it, uh, that it's not, but it is. And Jesus talks about this in, in, in Luke chapter 14. And that's where I'm going to uh, be this morning. Uh, just a little background in the first 24 verses of Luke 14. Um, Jesus goes to the house of a chief Pharisee on the Sabbath. And the Bible says in verse 1, they watch him. They're always watching Christ. He performed seven miracles on the Sabbath. And I think he did it just to stick his thumb in their eye. Just to prove that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. But this happened on the Sabbath. And they put a guy right across from him that was, that was diseased. He had the dropsy. And uh, dropsy is, is nothing more than swelling caused by excess water trapped inside your body, like an edema. Well, this poor guy was sitting right across from Jesus, and they watched him. What's this guy going to do? You know, it is the Sabbath. 
So Jesus, um, uh, out of nowhere, he just the Bible says in answering them, he said, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? Now, I've, I, I've read this a couple times. Nobody asked him a question. But Jesus answered him and said, is it lawful? Do you think Jesus may have thought this was a setup? I think he probably did. But now he's, the Bible says that he asked the lawyers and the Pharisees. So it was more just the chief Pharisee here. There are other Pharisees and lawyers. Some, some versions of the Bible said that these lawyers were experts in religious law. And it made me think, don't ever forget the definition of an expert. X is an unknown factor and a spurt is a drip under pressure. So that's what these guys are. That's what they were. And Jesus asked them two questions. Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? And then he said, which one of you that, that has an ox, uh, an ox or, or a donkey that fell in the pit wouldn't get him out on the Sabbath? You know what their answers were both times in the first six verses? Nothing. They couldn't answer him. They did the same thing to him when he healed this lady that was bent uh, in the back in, in Luke 13, just the chapter before. And Jesus ridiculed them and, and called them a hypocrite. The, the leader of the synagogue and the Bible said they were ashamed of what they had uh, of what they had tried to do. But anyway, they watched they watched Jesus. So Jesus tells them he heals this guy and then he and 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 then he rips them all because he knows what what this is. And then he goes on in verses seven through eleven. He he talks to all the the gatherers there, everybody that was at the feast at this supper, because the Bible says he watched them. He was, paying, he was paying attention to how, they, to how they jockeyed for position. They were looking for the chief seats. They wanted them. And Jesus went on to tell a parable and give them a really good parable about pride and humility. Because he ends in verse number, uh, uh, verse number 11, saying, he, who, who, Therefore, whosoever exalts himself shall be abased, and he that humbles himself shall be exalted. He was, he was putting the finger right on these guys that were so prideful. And then he talked to, the, to the, uh, the leader, the chief Pharisee, and he, and he talked to him about who he should invite to these things. He said, don't always invite your family and your friends and the rich people, then your rich neighbor, but invite those who have no chance of repaying you. Then you'll truly be blessed in heaven. And in verse number 15, some guy just speaks up and, and says, uh, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. It was just like a, like a cliche. Uh, J. Vernon McGee was talking about this passage, and he said he thinks that Jesus looked at this guy with a glint of anger in his eyes when this guy, this guy just spurted it out. It didn't really make any, any sense. It was just like a cliche, like, praise God, that, that we would do today. And, uh, but then Jesus went on in verses 16 through 24 to talk about a man who made a great supper. And he told his servant in verse number 17, go out and get everybody. What they did in, in, the, in the Eastern culture, they would, they, would, they would plan this meal. They'd plan this supper, and they'd go out and invite people. And the people would say, yeah, sure, I'll come. It was like an RSVP. But on the day of the supper, they would, the, the, like he, he did here in verse 17, he told his supper, he said, go out and get those people that were bidden, that were invited, and tell them, it's time to eat. Come on, and it's time. And, and then Jesus gave three successive weak and lame excuses that were given as to why they couldn't come. And at the end of that, he says in verse number 24, For I say unto you that none of the, those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. And why does he say that? Because these, these people made an excuse and rejected the offer, the invitation. When the time came, they rejected it. And the Bible tells us, that the that the the the, the man who, who made the supper who who uh, invited everybody he got mad, and he's told and he told his servant he said well go out and get the maim and the blind and the halt get the ones that 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 uh, don't deserve to be here let them know that they do deserve to be here and the servant went out and got him he said oh I got all these people but there's still room said, well go out into the highways and hedges and compel them to come in. The word compel means to urge, constrain, or beg. He wanted, to, he wanted to constrain these people by love, to let them know they were invited, they were welcome to the, to the, to the supper. But he said, those who were bidden, those who were invited and rejected me, won't ever eat at this supper. So then in verse 25, it says, And there went great multitudes with him, and he turned and said unto them. So apparently the supper was over. 
Now, I don't know if all these people were standing outside this guy's house waiting for Jesus to come out. I don't know if he, if he had left and started to walk and people said, oh, there's, there, there's, there's the Lord. And they flocked in around him. I don't know, but, but there was a, lot, a great multitude with him. And he suddenly turns to them and he, and, he, and he starts talking about what it is to be a disciple. You know, there's much more to being a Christian than just accepting an invitation to the Lord's table. There's a lot more than that, and Jesus was going to let him know it. And so this is what Jesus talks about as, as to being a disciple. In verse number 26, Jesus says, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, in his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Now, in the culture that we live in today, we hear all the time, oh, it's all about the kids. I love my family. My family comes first. We know that all sounds good, but it's wrong. Jesus says here that uh, you better put me first. Uh, in any and all uh, other relations, our lower priority. It, uh, in, in Exodus 34, after Moses destroyed the tablets of the Ten Commandments, God told him in, in, in verse number one, hew out two more stones, bring them up on the mount, and I'll write them again for you. And as Moses was up there on the mount, he was talking to the Lord, and this is what the Lord said himself in, verse, in, in Exodus 34, verses 12 through 14. He says, Take heed to thyself, lest thou make a covenant with the inhabitants of the land, whither thou goest, lest it be for a snare in the midst of thee. But ye shall destroy their altars, break their images, and cut down their groves. For thou shalt worship no other god. For the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous god. The Hebrew word for jealous implies its use of God as not bearing any rivals. God says, I'll put nobody else, you'll put nobody else in front of me. That's what the first commandment was all about. And the second commandment was pretty close. Thou shalt not make into thee any graven images. Um, and, and rest assured, Jesus did word, use the word hate. The Greek word is meseo, and it means to hate, detest. But by extension, it means to love less. It was a Hebrew idiom of comparison to show the definite difference between the relationship with him and everybody else. Christ is on a pedestal all alone. Uh, in Colossians chapter 1, verses eight, uh, 17 and 18, the Bible says this. Uh, and uh, this is talking of our Savior. It says, And He is before all things, and by Him all things consist. And He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things He might have preeminence. Folks, Christ doesn't want priority in your life. He wants preeminence. He wants first place. He wants nothing else before him. In Isaiah chapter 42, in verse number 8, he says, I am the Lord, that is my name, and my glory I will not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. God says, I'm not going to give my glory to some, some hunk of wood or hunk of rock that you guys carved out of man, man-made uh, uh, idol. I'm not going to give my glory to that thing. Now, I, I remember my pastor in Colorado Springs was a, Something fell off. Oh, the clip. <laughs> anyway, he was a missionary to Taiwan. And in this village that he, where he was a missionary, they had a, they had a bridge that, that, that connected the community to the city. And he said people would go into the idol shop, and they'd buy this idol, and they'd take it home, and they'd pray to it for a while. If it didn't work, they'd grab this thing, they'd walk up on this bridge and chuck it over the side. And then they take off back to the idol shop and go buy another one. My brother said, you'd walk up on this bridge and you could look over the edge and there were just hundreds, hundreds of idols laying down there in the bottom that didn't do diddly for these people. Well, that's what Jesus is talking about here. I'm not going to have any other idol taking my place. I want to be first. I want preeminence. I think it's funny because the third excuse that, that in, the, in the man who gave the supper was a guy who got married. Oh, I've married a wife and I can't come. Poor guy. <laughs> anyway. But he, he was putting family relationships before his Lord. 
And that's what Jesus is talking about here. You might get a, a better feel for the intent of this verse where he says, if you don't hate everybody else. Jesus talked about this again in Matthew chapter 10. In Matthew chapter 10 and verse 37, he says, He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He says, if you put anybody else before me, you are not worthy to be my disciple. And he says here in Luke chapter 14, when he, when, when he, he says in verse 26, if you don't do this, ye cannot be my disciple. You cannot be my, my disciple. One commentator said about Matthew 10, 37, and, and this passage, the greatest danger of idolatry comes not from what is bad, but from what is good, such as love and family relationships. The greatest threat to the best often comes from the second best. We need to be careful what we put. Anything you put before the Lord is an idol, and God hates it. He says, compared to all other relationships, it should be like you hate these other relationships compared to me. But he goes on. He's not done there. He says uh, in verse number 27, And whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. I think we've got um, uh, so accustomed to this expression, being prepared for trials in general, in general, for Christ's sake, or problems that we might face, we've lost sense of its primary sense. And that's be, to be prepared to follow Christ to death. We need to remember what a cross stands for. This statement probably terrified the listeners. Everybody knew what he meant. Why? Uh, this is what the Jewish Encyclopedia says. When the Roman general Varus had broken the revolt of Judas in Galilee in 4 BC, he crucified 2,000 Jews and placed the crosses by the wayside along the roads to Galilee. These, per these people knew exactly what the Lord Jesus was talking about when he said, if you don't be uh, take up your cross and follow me, you can't be my disciple. Carrying a cross led to death on a cross. Nobody carried a cross for fun. Nobody said, hey, you know what? I think I'll carry a cross. That sounds like fun today. No, they knew what it meant. Remember, Jesus, at the time that Jesus said this, he was on his way to Jerusalem to carry his own cross. 1 Peter 2.21, the book of 1 Peter gives us a, a preparation on, on suffering for Christ. But who's our greatest example? Our Lord. In 1 Peter 2.21, he says, For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Christ showed us how to suffer with dignity. He showed us how to suffer as a Christian. And he says right there in, in, in verse 21 of 1 Peter 2, that ye should follow in his steps. The intent was that we were going to follow Christ. That's why Jesus said, if you don't follow me, you cannot be my disciple. In, in, in Matthew 16, 24, Jesus says basically the same things to his disciples privately. He says, the uh, Bible says, then said Jesus unto his disciples, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. He says, deny himself in this passage. Warren Wearsby said this, about denying, uh, uh, denying oneself. He said, denying self is not the same as self-denial. We practice self-denial when for a good purpose we occasionally give up things or activities. But we, deny, but, but we deny self when we surrender ourselves to Christ and determine to obey His will. Folks, coming after Christ, taking our cross and following Him we understand that it's not God-centered, it's not man-centered, it's God-centered. We're supposed to deny ourselves. We're supposed to sacrifice for the will of our, of our Lord. We are supposed to surrender completely to His will. I was talking to the Sunday school class this morning about Paul calling himself a bondservant, a doulos. And in part of the description of that, of, of that word it's, it's someone who doesn't just do the will of the master because it's the master's will and he has to do it. 
it carries with it the, the, the intent that the master's will is your will. Whatever the master's will is, it's mine and I'm going to do it. Whatever my Lord wants me to do, whatever my master says to do, I'm going to do it because I love him and his will is my will. That's what a faithful servant does. And Jesus said, if, you, if you're not willing to do that, you can't be my disciple. It's impossible. So then Jesus wants to, wants to, wants to drive his point home. He gives two parables here in this passage in Luke about counting the costs. You better count the cost before you decide if you want to be a disciple or not. In verse number 28 through 30, in verses 28 through 30, he says, For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he hath sufficient to finish it? Lest happily, after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. You know, you, it, it, when you start to build something, you better sit down and take account of what it's going to cost to finish the job. He says, because if you don't, you're going to get so far and you're not going to be able to finish it and people are going to laugh at you and mock you and say, boy, what a dummy this guy was. You know, I can't help but think about there are a couple places here in town. I've driven by them, homes that have the foundation built up and then pff, the roof's on top. There are no walls. So basically, whoever's living in these homes live in the basement. That's it. They built the foundation, didn't finish it, and just put the roof over it. That's what he's talking about here. They, didn't, they must not have counted the cost for some reason, somehow, and they weren't able to finish their own home. And Jesus said, you better count the costs before you, before you start to build something. In verses 31 and 32, he says, or what king, going to make war against another king, sitteth not down first, and consulteth whether he is able with ten thousand to meet him that cometh against him with twenty thousand? Or else, while the other is a, yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassador, an ambassage, and desireth conditions of peace. So he says here in this, in this parable, uh, what trust or respect would, would a king garner if he didn't consider all aspects of a pending battle. Folks, battle is going to cost you something. Building and battle are all going to cost us something. And you better sit down and figure it out. You better count the cost before you decide whether you want to do it or not. Proverbs 28, or 20, verse 18 says, Every purpose is established by counsel, and with good advice make war. Don't just plunge into war. You better sit down and think about it. You better gain counsel. You better consider the cost of what you're about to do. And Jesus sums it up here in verse number 33. It says, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. Forsaketh all that he hath carries with it the idea of saying goodbye to all. In other words, it's absolute surrender. You know, Jesus says it another way in Luke chapter 9 and verse 62. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. If you ever plowed something, the last place you want to look is behind you. You want to look ahead. You want to look towards the, what you're plowing. If you look back over your shoulder, your row is not going to be straight at all. Folks, that's why, that's why Paul says, you know, uh, uh, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching, those thing, reaching out to those things which are before, I press toward the mark. Folks, that's why the rearview mirror in our cars are smaller than our windshields. We're supposed to glance in the rearview mirror, but we're supposed to look out the front windshield. And that's what G Jesus says, he says here. If you don't forsake all that you've got, if you're not willing to keep your face pointed forward and plow with, with, with steadfastness, if you look back, you're not fit for the kingdom of God. And he says here in verse 33, you cannot be my disciple. I couldn't help but add this uh, about this passage. This, this is a commentary from Dr. Bob Utley. And this is what he says. In light of this, Western modern Christianity is a weak manifestation of what's in it for me, cultural religion. 
Modern Western Christians have turned biblical faith into a weekly event. A place we can park our car for a few hours instead of a 24-hour, seven-day-a-week relationship of service to Christ. We only give the leftovers of our busy lives and plans to Him. We worship and praise Him with peripherals and non-essentials. This is why we have such large, beautiful church buildings and elaborate organizations and programs and no spiritual power, no changed lives, no whatever-it-takes attitudes. That's the fate of Western Christianity today. That's why I said, well, I think we've got a watered-down and weak view of discipleship. We think it's just some place we come on, on, on the weekends and make our faces known, but we have no spiritual power whatsoever. And Jesus begs to differ. Jesus deliberately laid out terms for discipleship. They were not soft, easy, or comfortable terms. They were harsh. They were severe. He was telling those folks and us that following him wasn't going to be easy, so everyone had better sit down and count the cost of real discipleship. You know, Jesus told his disciples in John 16, he says, These things have I spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. In this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. Folks, he said, you're going to have tribulation. There are going to be setbacks. There are going to be trials. I thought it was interesting that, that it, it, on uh, Paul's first, mi- first missionary journey, again in Acts 14, the very next verse from, uh, in verse 22 said, confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. Boy, there's a good pick-me-up, huh? That was really good. You're going to enter the kingdom, but through much tribulation, so you better hang on. But Jesus said, be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Folks, we're not fighting for victory here. We're fighting in victory. We've already won. Because Christ said, I've already overcome the world. I've done it. I've won. This was before the crucifixion, too, when he said this. Jesus Jesus told us and laid out the terms for discipleship. But there's one more thing that I felt that we must consider before deciding whether we're going to be a disciple of Christ or not. It's going to be a lifelong endeavor. Folks, you're not going to be able to spend two or three weeks in our discipleship classes and say, I got it. I'm in. I've got it. I've arrived. It's not going to happen. Implied by the terms, come after me in verse 27, followeth after me in Matthew 10, 38, or follow me in, in, in Matthew 10, 37. These all have carry with it the connotation of walking the same road. We're going to walk the same road as Christ. Jesus said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. Do you think the servant's any better than the master? Jesus said, here it is. This is the path you're going to have to walk. You better consider what it is, but it's going to be a long-term endeavor. In Matthew, 10, in, in Matthew 10, verses 1 and 2, I thought it was interesting. Verse 1, Jesus says, And he called his twelve disciples unto him. In verse number 2, it says, And the name of the twelve apostles were these. Huh. Is it disciples or is it apostles? Both. Why? Because discipleship's never going to end. We're going to keep, we need to keep learning. We're, we, we're, we're never going to arrive. I always said that the gospel was so nice and so easy that you can put it on the bottom shelf and any young child can understand it, what Christ has done for them and be saved. And yet you can put the Word of God up on the top shelf and you can study it for 50 years and never get it all. It's a lifelong adventure. Paul felt that way. In Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14, he says, not as though I've already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, that I may apprehend that for which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Then verse number 12, he says, but I follow after. 
The Greek word for that phrase, follow after, is the exact same Greek word in verse number 14 that says, I press toward the mark. Press and follow after, same word. We're pressing toward the mark. We're constantly following Christ. We're constantly trying to learn and understand what he has for us. Why would he apprehend? Why would he take a guy like me? Why would he take a guy or a woman like you? I can't explain it. But what am I going to do? I'm going to spend my life trying to figure it out and understand what Christ wants me to do. And that's what Paul said. He says, I don't get it all. I don't understand it. I can't explain it. But I know one thing. I'm not going to, I'm going to, I'm not going to rest on my laurels. I'm not going to keep looking behind. I'm not going to look back and over my shoulder and continually wonder, well, oh, man, am I good enough to do this? He said, nope, I'm going to press forward. I'm going to look ahead. I'm going to keep driving. And that's what Christ wants us to do. He wants us to drive. He wants us to not turn back. He wants us to keep pursuing. He wants us to keep stretching to be Christ-like. That's what God's personal intent is. Romans 8.29 tells us. God, the Bible says God has predestinated us to be conformed to the, to the image of His Son. Folks, we name the name of Christ. At some point, there should be a family resemblance. At some point, we should look like our Savior. Paul said in Philippians 1.20, he, he says, I want to magnify Christ in my body, whether it be by life or by death. He says, no matter what I do, whether it ends up in me living or whether it ends up in me dying, I want people to see Christ when they see me. I don't want them to see me. Because he says in the very next verse, for me to live is Christ. Huh, that kind of sounds like the bond servant. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He wanted other people to see him. And he didn't understand it all, but he kept pushing. And folks, that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to keep pushing. So we need to decide if we want to do that or not. We need to decide if the cost is worth it. But I couldn't stop at, at verse 33. I needed to finish the chapter. I felt kind of lame leaving the last two verses out. In verse 34, Jesus leaves us with, with, with an ominous warning. He says, salt is good, but if the salt has, has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor yet for the dunghill, but men cast it out. He that hath ears to hear, let him hear. Jesus left us a very sobering warning. In, in, in Matthew chapter 5, verse 13, he says, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden underfoot. Folks, it's no different than being lukewarm in Revelation 3.16. Jesus I wish you guys were one or the other. I wish you were cold. I wish you were hot, but you're neither one. You're warm. You stink. You make me sick to my stomach. I'll spew you out of my mouth. And that's what he's saying here. If, you don't, if the salt's lost its savor, what good is it? One of the uses of salt is as a preservative. You know, salt doesn't stop the decaying of meat, but it slows it down. We are not here to stop the, de the decay of the culture that we live in. But we're supposed to slow it down and how are we supposed to do that? We're supposed to stand and be counted for Christ and not be ashamed. A professing Christian who through corruption or being conformed to this world loses his or her distinctiveness, flavor, or preserving power. If they do that, they are no use as a disciple of Christ. And as the saying goes, they're not worth their soul. Folks, if we've lost our distinctiveness, if people look at us, we don't look at different. We, we, we walk the same. We talk the same. We act the same as everybody else in the world. What good are we? What are we supposed to do? If we've lost the savor, if we've lost the strength of our distinctiveness, we're good for nothing as a disciple. God wants us to stand and be counted for Christ. A person can be saved, but a person will never follow and serve Christ unless he or she is willing to make a sacrifice. There's a difference between being a believer and being a disciple. Or as one commentator put it, one can be a camp follower without being a soldier. 
Many people may make a commitment to Christ, but not nearly as many surrender to Christ. Luke, cha- uh, Luke, Luke on the brain. Romans chapter 12, Romans chapters 12 through 16 talk about practical Christian living. After all the doctrine, after all the talk about Israel, Paul says, okay, this is how you do it. But how does Romans 12 through 16 start? Folks, you can't do anything from Romans 12, 2 on unless you do Romans 12, verse 1. It says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's reasonable to do. I read in my Sunday school class today, 2 Corinthians 5, 14 and 15. It says, you know, if we, if we know that one died for all, then we're all dead. But when we understand what Christ did for us, we will henceforth no longer live unto ourselves, but live unto Him that died for us and rose again. Folks, if we have Christ as our Savior, we should understand what He did for us and say, you know what? I want that. I want to magnify Him. I want to follow Him. What He did for me, I, I, I owe the rest of my life to Him, and I want to serve Him, and I want others to know Him too. It's important for every one of us to stop and count the cost of being a disciple of Christ. The cost is high, but boy, is it worth it. Folks, all you got to do is read 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 9, and you'll see it. You'll see it. Verse 8 there says, Though having, uh, seen, uh, uh, having had him, but not seeing him yet believing, we rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory, receiving the end of your salvation, uh, even the, the end of your salvation, even the salvation of your soul, the end of your faith. Folks, one day we won't need our faith. We'll be home. We'll see our Savior face to face. But until then, we serve him, and it's very much worth it. But folks, if you, decide, if you, if you take into account and you count the cost of being a disciple, you also need to count the cost if you turn your back on Him. You need, to, you need to count the cost of not being a disciple. If you turn your back on Jesus Christ and receive Him, and, and do not receive Him as your Savior, you better count that cost too. You know, in Luke 14, where, where, the, where we had the parable of the man who made the great supper, and the servant went out and tried to get these people, and all, they all gave him lame excuses. He, 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 uh, he came back and told the master, he said, Sir, I tried, nobody showed up. And the Bible says he got mad. Why? Why would the master of the house get mad? Because he had all the food on the table and was going to go to waste? No. He got mad because they didn't reject the food. They didn't reject the meal, they rejected him. They rejected him. Folks, if you reject the gospel of Jesus Christ, always remember this. You don't reject something, you reject someone. The Bible tells us the definition of, of, of gospel is 15, verses 3 and 4. You have to read verse 1 to see it's the gospel. But it's the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The gospel was not a message, it's a person. It's no different than when, when Jesus said, Martha, do you believe you raised up Lazarus? And he goes, she goes, oh yeah, in the last day. And Jesus said, Martha, I'm the resurrection and the life. Resurrection is, isn't just an event, folks. It's a person. The gospel isn't just the text of the words. It's a person. It, uh, in Galatians chapter 1, in verse number 6, Paul tells the, 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 the Galatians, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. He didn't say, I can't believe you rejected the gospel message and turned to a different one. He said, I can't believe, I'm amazed that you so soon turned from him that called you to the grace of his son. Folks, when you, reject, when you reject Christ, you reject the offer that God's made to you. He's offered you. It's just like the supper. He's, 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 he has set the table, and it's all out there for you. All you got to do is receive it. And you better count the cost if you reject that. It costs something 
to be a disciple of Christ, but it costs a lot more to reject Him. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for this time together. Father, I thank You that, that You give us a very clear description of what it's like to be a disciple. Lord, in the, in the easy believism and, and easy following that we have today in the Western culture, Lord, we have a, a, a bunch of uh, 30, 40 year old babies that don't know what it's like to be a follower of Christ and honestly don't care to be. Lord, they just want the, their get out of hell ticket free card and go on and live their lives. And Lord, I thank you that you helped us to see that that's not what a disciple is all about. Father, I pray that you'll help us to count the cost. Help us to realize that it's absolutely worth it. And Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today that doesn't know Christ as their Savior, that they will realize the cost of rejecting Christ is far worse than, than the cost of following Him. Lord, I, I thank You for this time in Your Word. Help us to learn and grow from it, Father, that we'll better be able to serve You in all that we do. And we thank You, Lord, for condescending to use folks like us to bring the gospel to a lost and dying world. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Join us. Please stand and join us. Let's sing together now this wonderful song, Behold, 